It is with great regret that Mr. Shankly has intimated that he wishes to retire from active participation in league football. I couldn't believe it. Absolutely couldn't believe it. It was like morning. You thought you died, I'll tell you. You know, the, the supporters couldn't believe it. I swear it's the truth. Honestly, I'm not joking, really. Uh, what happened, son? Nah, you don't believe that. Oh, you're going to have me crying. <laughs> you having me yeah. on, aren't you? No, I'm not having you. I've just been, been to Anfield, honest. You said? There'd been no indication in that year that there was anything that was wrong and any reason why he'd want to pack in. It was exciting times ahead. And you've gone like that. It was an absolute bombshell. Liverpool had a ready-made replacement, but even Bob Paisley urged Shankly to reconsider. It's all very, very sad, really. Um, see, Bob Paisley said to him, look, Bill, I don't want this job. Go on a cruise. Take Nessie on a cruise. Take as long as you like and come back and pick up the... I'll run it while you're away. No, I'm going, Bob. That's it. When I, when I take a decision, I take it. You get guided by your conscience and all this stuff, you see. But... It's like walking to the electric chair, but once you've taken that decision, and all this sort of beautiful Shankly language, but in the end, he regretted it. I'm sure he did. Shankly couldn't stay away. He would turn up to training, upsetting Paisley, whose players kept calling Shankly boss. It was a difficult time. He needed football for starters. He used to go to Wrexham, he'd go, he'd go to the Everton training ground and play table tennis with Sid McGuinness, the groundsman. I think he realised very soon it was a drug and uh, he could not do without the drug of football. Under Paisley, Liverpool went on to enjoy a level of dominance never before seen in the English game. His predecessor gradually withdrew from public life and in September 1981, just seven years after his resignation, Bill Shankly suffered a fatal heart attack. His final wish? That his ashes would be scattered over his beloved Anfield. At the cop end, in the net, behind the goals, there's a casket, a foot down, and all the rest of the ground around the cop end is all sprayed with ashes. So the place is a, it's a shrine, really. It's a sacred place. Success can be measured in many ways. Bill Shankly may not have won as many trophies as some managers, but his legacy is huge. In 1982, the Shankly gates were opened outside Anfield by Bill's widow, Nessie, a permanent tribute to the man who'd done so much for the club. The bond between Bill Shankly and the cop was unique, and in 1994, when English football moved to all-seater stadia, Liverpool figures past and present were on hand to say goodbye to the famous old terrace. But the fans' loudest cheers were for one man. We used to go down to London by train in those days, and we'd travel back, and there'd always be Liverpool fans on there, and there'd always be one or two that would try and nick on the train for nothing, and uh, would get caught at, uh, by the ticket master as we were coming off. And I've seen on a couple of occasions when when Shankly has actually paid their fare because he, you know, he respected that they wanted to be there with, with Liverpool's game in London. He used to tell the players, you are playing for the people who come through the turnstiles. They're the people who matter. But if you give them what they want, you'll be the heroes. The supporters were everything for him. The Liverpool supporters were everything. He lit the fire. There's no question about that. I still drum it into my kids now of what he meant to Liverpool and how he started from nothing. He built the foundations for that fantastic football club without a shadow of a doubt. I'm a big supporter of that and I walked with them Shankly Gates and I think, you know, that man, what this club is today, he started it all off. And it needed somebody like Bill Shankly to do that. 